Proverbs 18, 7, a fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. Now this proverb is based upon a very simple principle plainly stated by our Lord in Matthew chapter 15. So if you would turn there with me, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10. Scripture sheds light on Scripture. A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. Now look what our Lord taught in Matthew 15, 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man. The Jews had these traditional teachings and laws that said if you you have to eat certain things on certain days and things like that, and you had to be careful to wash your hands ceremonially really well before you eat. But he said, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth. I imagine that was a shocking doctrine to them. This defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Not only is he destroying their traditional teachings, but you know their wheels are turning. What comes out of my mouth defiles me? And they may have, you know, reasoned to the logical conclusion of that. And that was offensive to them. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. <clears throat> Therefore, a fool's mouth is his destruction because of what comes out of the mouth, where it comes from, is our problem. Basic gospel truth that religion still doesn't understand. And being careful what you say is not the answer to this. I, I, I thought, what is the lesson here? Well, be very careful what you say. Guard what comes out of your mouth. We should be careful what we say. And we pray, Lord, keep the door of my lips. Don't let me dishonor you or harm your children or discourage your children by what comes out of my mouth. But what you say is not the root problem. The lesson is in this is we need a new heart. What comes out of the mouth reveals the sinful heart. And only God can change that. We should be careful. We should. Don't get me wrong. We should be guarded about what we say. Let your speech be always with grace. But the real lesson here is that our problem is what's inside not what's outside or comes out or goes into the mouth. It's our heart. 
So what, what would our advice be? What would the lesson be? Be careful what you say? Not really. Do that. But you know what my advice always is, and it's clear here. You need to hear from God. God changes the heart. And how does he do that? How does God change hearts? How does God teach us to forgive and to love and to be kind one to another? And our speech to be seasoned with grace and to think on the things of others and not just ourselves. How does he teach us that? By his word, by his gospel. Christ is not just our example in this. It's important to understand that. He clearly is our example. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He was kind and long-suffering and gracious to sinners. The scripture says grace pours from his lips, and it did, it does. But it was not just an example to follow. It's Christ in us that is our hope of glory, and it's our hope of ever being like him at all. It's him in us. I live, nevertheless, not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's what we need. More than just an example. He is our example. We do want to follow him, which we know that word means imitate. We do want to do that, but how are you going to do that? You're going to fail miserably in that endeavor unless something's going on in here. Something supernatural, something by the grace of God alone. Turn with me to Matthew 12. <clears throat> In, in reference to that. It's Christ in us. It's a, it's a complete transformation. Of the person. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good. And his fruit good. Or else make the tree corrupt. And his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Again, such a simple parable, illustration, example. You know what kind of tree it is. Some people can tell by the bark, but I guarantee you it's unmistakable. If it has bananas on it, it's a banana tree. <laughs> now you can't miss that. It's an apple tree if it has apples on it. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? The way you talk is because of what you are. You're snakes. And snakes have poison in their mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You see that? It's what you are. You're either a good tree or an evil tree. And you're not born like that. That's clear all through scripture. You're not born a good tree or an evil tree. But look at verse 35. Of good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure Notice of the heart. That's why the Lord said, I'll give you a new heart. People object to, to the idea of us having a new nature. How about a new heart then? Is that all right with you? A new heart, a new person, a new being, a new creation. Those are stronger words than nature. So why would you have a problem with that? We are by nature the children of wrath. Are you a child of wrath then? You go into hell? And then you're going to have to be a, have a new nature, if not. But I say unto you, verse 36, 
that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Because they reveal what you are. Good tree, bad tree, a snake or a sheep. Then notice the word snare in our text. I always want to talk about this because this word snare is used in the scripture quite a bit. And the illustration clearly is of an, uh, an animal caught in a snare. You use snares for, for one thing, as far as I know. You trap a an animal in it, a rabbit or, or whatever. A bird caught in a snare. And the nature of snares is that the more you do, the more you're caught. That's why this word is used in Scripture. Our struggles are not the solution. Our struggles just make the snare that much tighter because everything we do is sin. The more we do, the more we sin. The tighter the snare fastens itself upon us. And our words are like that. The more we say, the deeper we get. According to God, the more you say, the more ensnared you are. The more you do, the more you sin. The only way you get out of a snare is if someone comes where you are and looses you from that snare. And here's what that looks like in spiritual things. Getting out of the snare. You want to know what that looks like? Look at John 8, 31. John 8, 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. They're caught in the snare and don't even know it. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Now, it says they believed on him. That doesn't necessarily mean that they had saving faith because some believed on him because of the miracles and the Lord knew what was in their heart. He didn't commit himself to them because he knew what was in their heart. So I'm not sure here, but maybe they did and they just were ignorant as of yet. What do you mean, set free? What do you mean? We're not in bondage. Jesus answered them, verse 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the slave of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever. The son, the son abideth forever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, then you shall be free indeed. That's how you get out of the snare. The Son and His truth. Now we know from Scripture that when the Son, with the truth of the Gospel, sets you free, He gives you a new heart. That's why we've read what we've read about the heart. Out of the heart proceedeth these things. And when God gives you a new heart, as he said of that good tree, it bringeth forth good things. That's why Paul worded it the way that he did. He said, in me, that is in my flesh, in me as I am by nature dwelleth no good thing. But if Christ be in you, then something good dwells in you. He who alone is good dwells in you. His spirit dwells in you. And from that heart, Proceeds better things. And so I want us to look at a couple of on the positive side of this. 
as a believer. Uh, look at Colossians 4.3. Let's just turn to a few scriptures here. We'll be through. Colossians 4.3. With all, praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. Here we are talking about what comes out of your lips, what comes out of your mouth. Pray for us that God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, to speak of the Lord Jesus, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it clear, manifest, as I ought to. That's the way I ought to speak plainly, clearly, revealing what God's revealed to me. And then verse five, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time and let your speech. He's just talked about you pray for me that what I might say would be Christ. Clearly, plainly, the simplicity that's in Christ. And then he turns around and says this, let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. What a wonderful thing that would be that the Lord would grant us that. And may God make this so of us. Titus 2.7. Turn to Titus 2.7 with me. I'll have you turn to a couple more verses and we'll be through. Titus 2.7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good work. Show yourself an example of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness in, in the teaching of Christ. Say what he said. Gravity. Sincerity sound speech that cannot be condemned. You remember when the, when, when the apostles, they, by the power of Christ, raised that layman, and they said, this is, this is, don't look at us like we did something. This is the Lord Jesus Christ has shed this abroad, the one that you crucified. And they could say nothing against it. Remember when it said that? They could say nothing against it. If you preach the truth of the gospel, plain and clear and show people, look what it says. They can deny it. They can gnash their teeth, but they can't say anything against it. Well, that doesn't mean that. Well, then what does it mean then? Well, I don't know, but it doesn't mean that. Yeah, you don't know. Until God shows you, you're not going to know. It cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. They may not let on that they are, but he's sitting there telling you, put them to shame with the truth of Christ. Not, not just because you want to shame them or you want to, you know, be superior. And I know better than you. But if somebody believes that God loves everybody, they ought to be ashamed of that. How can you read this book and say that? If somebody believes and says Christ died for everybody, you ought to be ashamed of that. It's not unclear. having no evil thing to say of you. They can't, can't deny it. They can avoid it, get mad at you and all that, but you can't deny the truth. And then Ephesians 4.29, let's look at this together in closing. Ephesians 4.29 
Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now you see what he's talking about by corrupt communication. It's not using bad words, which, you know, why, why use bad words? But listen, that which is good to the use of building up that it may minister grace to the hearers. And that word corrupt, it means putrefaction. When you lie about God, it is putrid. We don't just disagree with it. It makes us sick in our stomach to hear it. It's disgusting. To, to defile the truth of him who is altogether lovely is disgusting to those who know him. And grieve not, verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So you see what he's talking about? Proceed, don't let it come out of your mouth. So that's what he's talking about all through this. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness, don't let bitterness come out of your mouth and wrath and anger and clamor and evil, what? Speaking. So you see what he's saying here. Don't let it come out. Be put, but let it be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. What comes out of your mouth is what it is because of the condition of your heart. May God give us kind and humble, forgiving, Christ-honoring hearts, and let the redeemed of the Lord, what did David say? Let the redeemed of the Lord talk like it. May God make it so. Let's pray.